This week we're doing something a little different, lads and lassies. Namely an interview with, or podcast, with Cindy Valor. Cindy is an editor, researcher and writer that runs her own website, Pirates and Privateers, where she has been writing articles about pirate topics since the early 2000s. Not only does she read an incredible amount of sources to write these articles, but she's an internet pioneer as well. She's also been working on a historical novel about the privateer society surrounding John Lafitte, which we'll discuss in length in the interview. I promise you, it will be great, so stay tuned, it's, it's a bit long. Anyway, without further ado, let's get into it. Why don't you start out by, um, of course, telling us a bit about uh, who you are and uh, what you do. Okay, my name is Cindy Valor, I'm the editor of Pirates and Privateers, and um, I've been writing about pirates for 20 years, uh, reading about them even longer. I'm also a writer and a freelance editor, mm-hmm. and a former librarian. How long have you been? Uh, how long you been doing the website? Um, two thousand, two thousand one, somewhere is oh, wow. when I started. Uh, about the same time I started writing full time. Oh wow! What did you What did you start out writing? Um, I initially uh, submitted um, a novel about the rising of seventeen forty five in Scotland. Oh, okay. And um, that was the book that was published. But I, I've been writing and working on um, another book about Jean Lafitte, the pirate. Mm, yes. Um, for 40 some years. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're definitely going to get into, into that one. And that's um, going to form a great part of the interview, of course, because it's, okay. uh, it's very interesting. But um, uh, you, did you start working as an uh, editor back then, too? Um. Not professionally. I, I had friends and fellow writers who would ask me to edit things, and I had okay. edited. I was served as the editor for the yearbook um, where I worked um, in the newspaper because I was um, the, uh, the teacher who was advising mm. on news. And uh, how, did you, how and why did you start a website in the Pirates and Privateers? I started... I actually started that, not my website, but with um, a data, an online database that um, was looking for writers who could write about a particular subject that they were passionate about. I was going to write about Scotland, mm. but they already had lots of writers writing about Scotland. <laughs> and the other thing that I had done much research about was pirates. And nobody was writing about pirates, so oh, wow. I started writing about pirates. And then um, I don't remember exactly when it was, but the database changed some of the rules mm-hmm. for their writers, and I decided okay. that to move it over to my own website. And I've been writing there ever since. So how did you how did you get first to get into pirates? I started learning about pirates because I was watching an episode of Walt Disney's uh, Sunday evening show and he introduced the gentleman pirate Jean Lafitte Mm. and I always I always went in for the mysterious you know the the true crime and that you don't know much about the event and that type of stuff plus Mm. the fact that Jean Lafitte was responsible for helping Andrew Jackson and the Americans win the Battle of New Orleans. Right. And so it stirred an idea, and my grandparents had been to New Orleans, so my grandmother got really into helping me with some of sharing some of the things that she had learned while she was there, and I started doing research on a story idea. Mm. Oh, wow. How old were you when, uh, when this started? I was in college freshman year, so All right. um, 18, 19. So, so you were not one of those that, like, say, grew up with uh, Treasure Island or Captain Blood or one of those? No, my, actually, my um, parents gave me Treasure Island for Christmas one year when I was a teenager, and I just could not get into that book. <laughs> And I, I mean, I know the story, right? but um, in fact, I didn't read it until maybe my 40s or 50s or 60s. Mm. Um, 
Was that after you had uh, started the website? Oh, yes. Long <laughs> after that. In fact, I did it because I was reviewing a book. It was a children's version of Treasure Island. And I, I think I was reviewing that. But I actually got interested in pirates probably because I was a fan of Errol Flynn's and mm. I watched Captain Blood right. one day. And um, then in college, I tended to go to bookstores a lot and I saw Raphael Sabatini's novels. And so I picked up Captain Blood and I read it. It's very different from the movie, mm. um, but it was interesting. It didn't mean a whole lot to me at the time it wasn't until much later when I, after I started the website and I did an article about the history behind Captain Blood and I reread the book, mm. that I realized how much research he had done. Right, yeah. In writing the book. Yeah, definitely. And of course, and of course I knew a lot more history by then, mm. both about Scotland and the Jacob Jacobite Wars and pirates. So, it meant a lot more to me. Right. Yeah, and you also had learned the, um, of course, the process about researching and sort of uh, could get into his shoes more, I assume. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, well uh, so you said that kind of like the, what fascinated you about uh, John Lafitte early on was the sort of like mystery and the sort of true crime nature of it. So right. what, do you, what do you think that sort of separates uh, sea rovers and pirates in history from uh, other criminals? Well, aside from the obvious that they they do most of their uh, illegal work at sea, um, they, I don't think there's a lot of difference mm. um, aside from the weapons they use, um, maybe the techniques that they use because it's different to fight at sea than it is to fight on land. Mm. Um, I, I never really thought about the differences between the two because I actually haven't studied the other you know, criminals on land hmm. much. Yeah, there definitely isn't uh, a, a, as wide a sort of cultural movement associated with other criminal groups. I, get, I guess there is uh -huh. a bit, I guess there is quite a lot about the mafia and uh, so, to some degree at the uh, the Wild West outlaws, but... Uh. Right, but each each is different in its own way. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're bloodthirsty to some degree, but not all of them are. Mm. And and I think, so therefore, I think there are some similarities and what you, what you, what you um, describe as a whole doesn't always pertain to everybody who was a member of whichever group, be it pirates, mm. the Wild West or whatever. I don't think you should glorify them. Mm. I think you should paint them for what they were criminals yeah definitely i mean you you worked as a teacher right do you still work as I a did. teacher no no i get well i, I worked in schools for mm. 20 years and then um retired because my husband was transferred um and i didn't have to work anymore i teach in the in online to people who want to know about different subjects a lot of them are writers who want background information for their stories. Okay, wow, that's pretty cool. What do you? What are these subjects you uh, teach in? I teach some of Scottish culture and history. Oh. Um, a lot of them have to do with. Um, a lot of my courses have to do with piracy and maritime. Right. Uh, one of one of the ones I'm getting to teach next next year will be Age of Sail. Ooh. Um, which I don't get to teach very often because it it's actually takes eight weeks to do. Right. I mean, it's a very long period. It's also a very vast subject. Yeah. Um, but I also talk about the Royal Navy during mm. um, Nelson's time period. I have a class that we just finished about dragons. Mm. And I t teach about historical fiction. And, right. how to, and how to edit your own work. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, how, how to edit your own work. That's uh, very valuable knowledge. Uh, just learning how to look at uh, your own stuff uh, critically. Yes, it is. Um, it's, it's a way for writers to polish their work before they submit it to a professional editor. Mm. Because you should, 
especially when you're writing a story. You should always do that because it gives you a fresh pair of eyes. Right. And they will catch things that you won't. Yeah. And the same is true. I, I'm an editor, but I don't edit my own work because mm. I don't see what's there. Yeah, of course. What's not there. Yeah. Do you think there's also like a time aspect involved? Like you should sort of let your work uh, rest for a while before you return and read it? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I do that. Mm. Like when I finish an article, I will usually give it to my husband to look at. Mm. Um, and it can take him a while to get around mm -hmm. to reading it. Yeah. But um, And then right before I'm ready to publish it, I will go back through it. So mm. I always leave some time between the writing and the publishing right. um, to look at it. Yeah, so I've, I've always got the, from when I, from when I looked at your, uh, your articles, and uh, I've uh, read quite a few of them, you always have these very long like um, uh, references, like uh, lists of sources. And that, mm -hmm. that was something that always really impressed me. So I'm just curious, how many, how many books do you read like in a month, just in a month? I have no idea. <laughs> um, oh, wow. I don't, I, I really don't because it varies depending on um, how much time I have to read. Mm. It also varies on whether I'm interested, really interested in the book. Mm. Um, like right now I'm reading a book called Storms of Retribution. Oh which it's not really a pirate book, but there are some pirates in it. Um, Every good story needs to have pirates in it, of course. Well, yes, but this is not a pirate book. Yeah, this yeah. is a, it's, it's about the middle, it, it's in the middle ages when um, Sal Salah Adin mm. um, is trying to take Jerusalem. Oh, wow. And um, the, it's, a, it's a series of books uh, called the Talon series that are written by James Bosher. And I love reading these books. Um, it introduces me to cultures I'm not f real familiar with. Right. Um, and I like the character. Talon is someone who's, I think it's French descent, but he's captured He's captured by the Assassini mm. um, as a child and taught to be an assassin. Okay. And um, so this is, it, it's basically his life over a series of books. Oh, wow. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and it's a nice break from reading all the pirate stories. <laughs> I, yeah. I can read anywhere from two pirate books to five or six during that time. But at the same time, I may, may be re reading books that are for personal right. pleasure. Yeah. Or um, I also review for um, historical novels, review and discovering diamonds. So there are lots of, as well as good reads. So I could I could read any number of books in the course of a. Yeah, I've seen your um, I've seen your um, list of all the book reviews as well. And it's there's a lot of books in there. It's very impressive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember all of them or do you do you just like remember their plots or? Do I remember every book I've read? No. <laughs> I remember stories that really stick with me. Mm. On the, if they're nonfiction, I will remember the topic. So mm, I'll right. know whether it was a good book, a really worthy book to go yeah. get research from. Um, for example, um, The Pirate Hunter by uh, Richard Sachs um, was a good book for me to, to consult while I was working on my East India, the Ooh. East Indies Company wow. series, because William Kidd um, actually gets hanged because of the things that he did that irritated mm. the East, the East, EIC. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah, I know they were, uh, they have some very uh, I interesting influence in pirate history. Like, for example, I remember that. Um, uh, Woods Rogers, who you're, uh, I know you're researching him at, at, at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. He wanted to establish a colony on Madagascar to uh, sort of combat the piracy there. But the right. East India Company thought that his um, uh, a um, a colony there would disrupt their monopoly more than the pirates. Yes, anything to anything that would throw a wrench in their profits would not was not welcome. Yeah, so like it it doesn't matter, you know, if these uh, pirates you know go around and uh, you know kill people and harm people in the area, you know, as, as long as it doesn't hurt their monopoly as much as the other right. option. 
yeah, so I got I definitely got to check out that article. That sounds very interesting. Um, well, I am work. I'm actually working on the writing of it now. Oh, okay, okay. I see. And it'll be, and and I I know from already that it'll be a more multi part because a lot is written about his round the world trip, which oh, was yeah. which was his privateering. Yeah. And then there's a bit about the Madagascar. Yeah. And then. Uh, yeah, his merchant voyage. Right. Then the Bahamas. Yeah. Because in a in actuality, that was what, because Madagascar failed, that's why he went to the Bahamas. Right. Yeah, of course, that's uh, that's also something that uh, uh, my audience will have to look out for and um, definitely check out. Mm -hmm. uh, so focusing on a bit of that uh, period around Rogers uh, on the golden age of, uh, just the wider golden age of sea roving. So uh, when sort of Caribbean piracy really flourished from around 1630 to 1730. Uh, do you think that that period has had any profound effects on history as a whole? To some extent it has. I think it has, I actually think it has a lot to do with um, why piracy um, went from being um, welcome, in other words, for protecting the islands and and bringing money into their into the governor's coffers and, and helping supply what the mother nations or father nations could not give their colonists. But when the islands started creating their profitability, such as with the sugar cane and slavery, right. yeah. um, then attitudes started changing too. And as mm. a result of that, piracy became the enemy of all mankind and we won't tolerate piracy, period. Right. And I think that's the profoundest effect history-wise, although some would tell you it's their articles of agreement and their uh, everyone is equal influence like the American Revolution mm. and, <laughs> and those types of things. Yeah. Um, I think it has more to do with influencing culture. Mm. Um, because even today we romanticize piracy and we, um, pretend to be pirates mm. on talk like a pirate day, which is coming up. Oh yeah. Um, and the pirates we choose to emulate are the ones from the golden age. Mm. Yeah. That very last, uh, rump age, like the, uh, right. 1715. Right. For like Blackbeard and, yeah. um, Bartholomew Roberts and Stead Bonnet and mm. uh, Calico Jack and uh, Anne Bonnie and Mary mm -hmm. Reed, all yeah. of them. What I think is interesting is we don't emulate uh, the ones like Ed Lowe from the Buccaneers, Francois Lolonet, mm. um, because they were really, really brutal men. Right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, th I think it's very interesting that you mentioned also the... Uh, uh, the sugar trade there, because mm -hmm. uh, on one on one hand the uh, pirates and buccaneers were re really responsible for kicking off the slave trade, like by uh, you know their their plunder helped uh, you know investing and really building the initial infrastructure on Jamaica, for example. Sure. Uh, and uh, but then of course the slave trade by uh, building up the economy of these colonies, it kind of became the downfall of piracy as well. Mm hmm. So that. Uh, oh, sh sure. I mean. Um... Sir John Hawkins and Sir Francis Drake, uh, they, especially Hawkins, was the one who what made the first initial slavery voyage for the English mm. into the Caribbean. He, he purposely made that because he wanted to make inroads in Spain's colonies mm. and, and trade, but um, it was the English who, who really went to Africa and brought the the Africans over and over time they're the ones who build up the slave trade the right. Spanish had slaves but they tended to use the indigenous people right. of the islands and the and the Spanish main right uh, to do that this the work of the slaves right and they used the um, 
Uh, they used a form of surf them as well, like um, encomienda, I think it's called. I'm not sure. Not, I don't know about that. Uh, like it's, um, uh, they were um, so so essentially they weren't, they weren't literally slaves. They had uh, more restricted freedoms, but right. they were still mm. uh, for essentially forced to do like they couldn't move from an area and that sort of stuff. So like surf them. Right. Uh -huh. But do you think that the uh, Golden Age, uh, as I define from like 1630 to 1730, that sort of period, or even just the Rump Age, uh, do you think that should be taught in schools as a teacher? I think it, I think it should. I know it is. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly would have been a lot more interested in history <laughs> <laughs> in, in school. It had my teacher said, oh, we're going to talk about pirates today, right. um, be it good or bad um, or both. Mm -hmm. um, what I find fascinating is that there are teachers who talk about pirates uh, with their with their students who aren't necessarily history teachers because mm -hmm. you can wow. you can you can apply things about piracy to almost any topic. Mm -hmm. um, so if if you're teaching math, you might do math um, mm -hmm. because the pirates needed math in order to be able to do take care of their cargo right. their illicit cargoes and so did the shopkeepers who bought them right the plunder yeah yeah there's uh i think there's definitely a case for the uh, economical and societal side as well like i know i know there's one book published like i think it's called the invisible hook yes um, mm -hmm. so it talks uh, i haven't read but uh, i know it talks about uh, uh, piracy from that sort of uh, economic uh, angle Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you do you know any teachers or like any classes that are where they're taught uh, about piracy? Um, I don't know any personally, but mm. I have had teachers and students who contact me and ask me for information mm. or you know suggestions of where they could go to get resources, mm. um, either to use in class or to support or to support whatever argument they're trying to prove to their teachers. Right. Do you, uh, this is um, uh, the, does that extend extend beyond America? Like, for example, do you know any uh, any classes or such held on pirates in, say, like? Uh, I mean, I think the most important ones would be England and France. Yeah, I know. I've had um, one or two American schools in European countries come and ask for information. Oh well. Wow. Um, I have probably taught. Uh, corresponded with students in other countries more than I have adults mm. and it's pro it's because they're doing a paper okay um, but it's difficult for me to recommend resources in say German or French mm. yeah um, although I do have contacts in those countries where I could probably ask um, if they can suggest something uh, because I although I can read some French I'm familiar with English resources be yeah. it those published in England or Australia or the United States or Canada yeah uh, than I am French and French resources I can read them but it takes me a long time because I'm not as conversant mm -hmm. in French as I used to be and also yeah. it's a totally different language when you're working with a maritime subject right yeah and especially when it's uh, older works from the 1700s exactly mm -hmm. yeah because I, I know that the uh, one of the reasons i really regret that i never learned french is because of uh, labat's work mm -hmm. it's uh, it's it's such a, so extensive and it, it's it's such a shame that it has never been translated either because from the glimpses i've seen it's it seems really rich in the more mundane side of things mm -hmm. uh Right. Uh, I want to I wanna know more about your, your book. Uh, so the, your current writing project, the book that you mentioned you've been working 40-odd uh, right. years on, The it, Rebel on yeah. the Spy, right? Right. The Rebel on the Spy. Um, it's about a woman who is the sister of Dominic Yu. Dominic Yu being a real person um, who was a lieutenant... Um, or a privateer who worked under Jean Lafitte. And Dominique Yu was, became really well known 
because he was one of the gunners on the battlefield at the Battle of New Orleans. Oh, wow. And he and Renato Belouche, who was the other captain of the guns, uh, and the Baratarians, which were the Jean Lafitte's men, mm -hmm. um, they made, they did really, they were expert gunners, so they did a really good job um, at damaging the English guns and men right. on the opposite side of the battlefield. Is this like, and, is this cannon experience that they had? Did they learn it at sea or at uh, previous? Yes. Oh, wow. Well, there there is some legends that Dominic Yu was a gunner for Napoleon before oh. Napoleon got to be the emperor. Oh, wow. Um, but there's there's no proof of that, that that's true. Um, makes for a nice story, though. Yeah, a tavern rumor. Yes. And um, the uh, male uh, protagonist in the story is um, a spy for <clears throat> who is working for Madison, President Madison, um, just to learn more about Barataria and, and what capabilities um, Lafitte has and, um, you know, how many men he has, mm. how they might be useful or harmful mm. to the American cause during the War of 1812. It's not his primary reason for going to New Orleans and uh, Barataria, which is where the pirates were based. Um, it's uh, to, he, he gets a note from a sea captain that, who passes on this note um, from pirates to tell him where his brother is. And his brother was, was uh, impressed into the Royal Navy oh. and disappeared. And so he wants to find his brother. Right. And that's what brings him to New Orleans. Oh, wow. So uh, I trust them that those characters are the, uh, the rebel and the spy in the title. They are. And um, then it follow, It starts in, I think it's 1810, mm -hmm. before uh, Pierre Lafitte uh, has his stroke. Mm. Um, and that's, that's a historical event. Right. And goes through uh, 1815 and the Battle of New Orleans. And it's, it's, it shows you what it was like to be one of Lafitte's men. Mm. And what was hap what was happening in the world, the female protagonist's character arc is the fact that the world is changing. And mm. what was acceptable, being a privateer, isn't as acceptable anymore. Right. And so she has to figure out what's she going to do since she can't continue to be a privateer. Right. Yeah, this is, if I remember correctly, this is only just 20 years or something before uh, privateering is uh, abolished. Uh, officially abolished in 1858. Hmm. Um, but, uh, of course, the United States didn't sign that mm -hmm. agreement. And so it was still, we could still do privateering, okay. which we did during um, the American. Yeah, the commerce raiders. Uh, right. Um but for all intents and purposes, privateering, um, with the exception of Spanish independence, the different nations in South America and Central America that were trying to gain their independence from Spain, um, they used privateers. Oh. But they were they were the main, they were the last of the privateers. Right. Well. Wow. That would also be a very interesting topic to read about because uh, that's not something I'm very well versed in. Well, see, uh, Renato Belouche, who is one of the participants in the Battle of New Orleans and uh, worked with Feet, mm -hmm. goes on to become, um, I think it's an admiral oh, of wow. Bolivia's Navy during this time, during mm -hmm. that time period of the privateers. And Jean Lafitte joined. Uh, Cartagena's privateers. Mm. Oh well. Yeah, we got. Uh, we already got uh, a sequel uh, 
speculation here. <laughs> well, I, I was curious when you said, uh, when you talked about PS stroke, uh, how, uh -huh. how did that uh, affect uh, uh, historical events and how does that affect the story? Um, I don't know so much that it really um, affected history. It affected his abilities. Mm. Um, he would... Pierre was the brains behind the whole Lafitte operation. No. Um, John Lafitte was the front man. Right. Um, but um, his stroke uh, caused him to be, um, he couldn't write as well. Mm. Um, William C. Davis talks a lot about um, the change in how he wrote and how he signed his, his name. Okay. Um, wow. As well as um, he wasn't. Jean Lafitte was known as fastidious and always dressed well. Okay. But uh, his brother Pierre, especially after the stroke, was known to not have been such a snappy dresser. <laughs> I really and, hope for um, some. Uh, I really hope for some illustrations then in in the book. <laughs> Well, my illustrations are always in words. Um, oh, I see. As yeah. to how I wow. describe those things. Oh, wow. Yeah, that sounds um, that sounds really exciting, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was curious since since you live in Texas, which is in proximity to the locations that uh, Lafitte visited and even operated out of. Uh, how mm -hmm. does it allow allow you to conduct research? Well, um, I actually have been to New Orleans uh, twice. Right. Um, one to do a bit of research, but the second time I went um, was shortly before Hurricane Katrina. Mm. And um, I was able to find some documents at uh, one of the libraries um, that were actually written about uh, Dominic Yu and um, when he came into New Orleans after the hurricane of 1812 right. um, and what happened. Um, I also found um, an inventory of what was on his ship oh, wow. at one time. There's another one about what was on uh, one of Jean Lafitte's ships. And these are all things that get I, I'm able to then take and weave into the story where it's pertinent. Um, right. I have visited um, Galveston, which is where... Um, Lafitte went after New Orleans mm -hmm. um, but there's not much there mm. of his uh, enclave uh, there's there's a building that's reported to be have been built on the site of where his house was okay. uh, but um, between the a hurricane that struck that um Galveston Island, both in 18, I think it was 1818, and Lafitte burning the entire place when he left mm. at the at the behest of the American Navy, mm. and then um, several later hurricanes. There's not there's not much there, other than the fact that it's Galveston Island and this is where he was. Oh, I see. Though I imagine that it really. Um that it can help to um, to describe the nature and the sort of geography of what the lay of oh, the sure. land looks like. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, got any... some nice, I got some nice pictures of the Gulf of oh, Mexico. Yeah. So. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think of course, which uh, I think a lot of writers today take it for granted. Just, oh, oh, I'll just look up some pictures. But, you know, uh, there's also, you know, the smells and the temperatures and just the, you know, just the feeling of a place. Exactly. And one of the things that I got to do when I went to... New Orleans the second time was there's a Jean Lafitte National Park, oh. which um, is in the bayou mm -hmm. and you can walk through it. So I've got lots of pictures that I took. So I know what it's like to be in the bayou and they you had to go. <clears throat> That's how Jean Lafitte went from Barataria to New Orleans was through the bayou. Right. Um, so you get to see the animals, you get to see um, the the foliage, foliage um, and and the plants and stuff. So it all helps to create the 
the visual imagery um, so you think you're there. Right. Yeah, and it's a, it's a very hostile environment, especially back then, I imagine. Oh, yeah. I think it's pretty hostile, too. Can be now. Yeah. Um, just with the predators, the natural predators, like yeah. the alligators. Right. I, I trust since since it's a pirate novel, I'm gonna I'm gonna presume that there's gonna be at least a bit of sailing in the book. There uh, is, although you're not gonna get a lot of detail about how to sail because I don't know how to sail. <laughs> I, um, I see. Yeah. Um, you 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 get to know what it's like to be on a schooner, mm. um, and in fact, you get to be on two different kinds of schooners. Okay. Um, because. One of the things that I learned was that Dominic Yu had a schooner. Okay. And that schooner was severely damaged in oh. the hurricane. Mm. He was at sea at the time it struck. And um, one of the masts fell. And supposedly he was caught under it. And leg was either broken, crushed, whatever. Mm. And um, so he needs another one built and that's where my heroine comes in because she has the she's been good and saved her money rather than spending it on wine and women <laughs> and song you know yeah uh, but they make arrangements for um thomas kemp to build a schooner for them okay and thomas wow. kemp thomas kemp was a shipwright in what is was fells point you we'd call it baltimore today okay um but fells point was a town of its own right next to baltimore right and it in eight in the early 1800s england called baltimore the nest of pirates oh wow um because that's where the schooners with their rake mask and mm. rake, rake mass is one that's tilted at a yeah. really sharp angle um, were built. Um, if you're familiar with the Pride of Baltimore or the Pride of Baltimore II, um, those are examples of these schooners that mm. were built during the War of 1812 in Baltimore. And so you get to go to Baltimore, you learn to see what it's like there and um, the building of that, and then they have to get out of Baltimore during just as the British are starting to blockade. Okay. And you'll also go back because um, to Baltimore because um, there's the bombardment of Fort McHenry. Mm. The British um, attack one of the forts of Baltimore and my male protagonist is there at the time. Mm. Um, one of the interesting pieces of research that I, that I had is there is online a map of Baltimore in 1815 Okay. So you can actually go through the streets, see where different buildings were, what they were. Wow. And um, including Fells Point. I lived in Fells Point for a time. Okay. And um, Thomas Kemp's shipyard does not exist anymore. It's mm. now it's 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 a street to be um, right on the water. Mm. But if you want to see what the shipyard might have looked like and what was around it. This map allows you to do that. That sounds really amazing. Like well, it, 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 it is. And, and it was done as a, a 3D oh, wow. project. And actually, if you could go to see this where it was done um, in one of the museums, hmm. it was and it was done in part by the University of Maryland hmm. in Baltimore. Um, oh, wow. What they did was they showed this is Baltimore in 1815 versus this is what it looks like uh, sometime in 2000s. Right. Um, there, there was a there was an actual division, so you could see the two side by side. Mm. Um, but it's it's a 3D, and you can walk the streets, and it really helped me create a real place. And I right. wish they had this for all different places but yeah. they don't yeah of course i mean I'd, I'd love to have something something like that for like um, i mean kayon on tortuga uh, you know nassau of course port royal yeah. you know that would be really amazing 
because I mean you can't you can always uh, like for example you talked about Galveston uh, I imagine that leaves of course a lot of space for imagination which you know it's great you can do whatever you want but at the same time um, fiction or well what's real reality will always be more detailed and always have more stuff than what you uh, can come up with yourself certainly but the but the problem is was it recorded yeah um, see that's one of the things that I discovered in doing research is that as a writer, we would like a plan of a ship and what it looks like inside. Mm. Um, they shipwrights did not build ships that way. No, no. Um, and so I've learned, I've taken what I've learned so that the readers can see, can imagine what the two schooners look like inside. Mm. Yeah, of, uh, of course, it, it, it does kind of help when you're talking about these uh, these smaller vessels. They don't uh, have a lot of space anyway. Mm -hmm. But do you... I don't really know how to frame this question, but what, what would you say, like, the sort of theme or the sort of overall purpose of the of the book is? Like, is it just to be an interesting story or do you uh, have, like, a, a sort of statement on pirate history or history as a whole do you want to make? Um, well... For me, it's to, to share the to share in an interesting way mm. um, what the Baratari who the Baratarians were and what they did, and that includes Lafitte. Mm. But it, it's also to give to portray both the pirates as well as war and mm. what it's really like. Right. Um, because this is this this will be the second book that I've done based on a war. I find them fascinating in the sense that how do you get to this point where you actually take up arms and how do each side how does each side conduct the war and what happens to the people who have to fight it? Mm. That's what interests me. Right. Because yeah. we 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 say and hear this many people died or we fought for mm. this long, but yeah. what, what did that mean to the actual combatants? Right. And what did that mean to the people who lived in those areas where right. they fought? I mean, these are times bef long before there were cameras, so there were no pictures. Um, and the pics, except what artists painted, and they didn't usually paint those until after the fact. Mm -hmm. We'll take the Battle of New Orleans, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a series of skirmishes. It's not one specific day battle. Right. Um, it, it's spread over a month. Oh, almost, wow. Or actually, a, you know, like three three weeks. Because it's, I think the first one starts in around the 23rd of December. And the final battle is the 8th of, De of January. But on the day of January 8th, when the cannons were fired, the British were coming across this field of expanse at them. And they fought in the European manner, mm -hmm. more so than the American. And so all the men were lined up in several ranks. Things didn't actually go according to plan. Um, and not everybody, all the things were miscued mm -hmm. um, so that things that they needed weren't where they were supposed to be at the time they needed them. But when Jackson ordered his men to fire their guns, which are cannon, mm -hmm. at the enemy, what you saw when the smoke lifted or the fog lifted, because it was foggy that morning, is a sea of red. It was just the whole field was blanketed by the British army wow um decimated yeah and and i think that's an important thing to understand that it's there's nothing pretty about war there's no real glory to it the other thing is that i i want you to understand that it's not just one place because like the battle of new orleans is fought in different places um in and around the area but at the same time that this was going on, it was also going on on the opposite side of the Mississippi River. 
um, and had the British achieved their objectives, they would have turned the guns on the, that were on the West Bank and faced them at our line, the American line. Mm. And the war would have been had a very different outcome had that yeah. succeeded. The, the problem when teaching history is that often used uh, teaches from this very sort of high point of view where it's only like statistics and it's only like these broader uh, political events rather than the mundane uh, everyday experiences of the people who are actually involved uh, exactly and uh, you know you know I think that I think that's more more way more interesting and I think like if you were to teach history in this more mundane everyday manner how what ordinary people experienced uh, both both fighters and civilians uh, I think it could I mean hopefully at least be interesting to more people mm-hmm. and one well one of my goals in, in writing the historical fiction is that I hope that what sh- what you read will pique your interest and maybe you'll go mm. and learn more about the history right um, in fact um, when I did um, a book talk for a group in Kansas after the publication of the Scottish Thistle, which is the book about the the yeah. rising of 1745, um, the organizer said she rarely does any more than read the books. But by the time she finished reading my book, she wanted to go and learn more about the rising of 1745. Oh well, and that's a high compliment to yeah. an author. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I remember that last week we also talked about. Uh, uh, John Lafitte's uh, involvement in the slave trade. Yes. Uh, how, how how big of a role will the slavery play in uh, in uh, the uh, the rebel and the spy? There is, I mean, there are slaves in the barracoons, which are the pens where they were kept, okay. um, that were that were captured by the different men who uh, brought them in to be sold. But you will actually experience. Um, a slave auction mm. but that's about that and you'll meet someone who's who's free now and lives in the bayou but uh her parents or at least one of her parents was a slave right and 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 escaped um where you learn her background and um her, her personal history right um because she's she's a char- she's a memorable character in that she uses all the cliches of what we think of as a slave and uses it against people okay. in order to you know she acts like she's supposed to but she's really a very intelligent person okay so is it kind of like a, a mask she's playing yes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i think uh, i think that is i read a bit about it uh, sometimes that's something that's actually occurred in history quite a lot even sure mm. well i think i think even even just like having having slavery play a part in a pirate novel is it's very interesting and very important of course most of all because it's it's lo- it's really been ignored in pirate fiction exactly the... it has um and and yet it was actually a part of pirate history right um yeah very important part even like we talked about a bit earlier with the uh, uh with the sugar trade and everything sure and uh, as you said about uh, i think john hawkins and uh francis drake mm-hmm. of course do you have a preference for the more fantastical speaking about pirate fiction do you have a preference for the more uh, fantastical or the more historical side of it well i prefer the history i occasionally read um fantasy um i just finished um when the Mermaid Sings by Helen Hollick. Okay. Um, she writes a series um, called the Sea Witch Voyages. Okay. So she includes mermaids and she includes witches, but her main character is Jezemiah Acorn, mm-hmm. and Jezemiah is um, a pirate, right? Slash privateer. Uh, during this time, you know, the time of Henry Jennings and Charles Vane, mm. and um, yeah, Blackbeard. I like enjoy that. her books. I enjoy her books. Yes, Blackbeard is in takes place in one of them because her series goes over a span of time. Okay. Um, and I enjoy her stories because they're heavy in the history, the historical fiction side. Right. Um, I like some steampunk 
um, too. But um, if you're just going to do like elves and fairies, mm. and I'm not real into that. Right, I see. Nor, nor do I wish you to do ghosts and um, the real horror-like uh, pirate stories. I'm not really mm. into those. So you're I not read the... occasionally, but I don't want to be frightened, so I can't. <laughs> okay. Go to Are you a fan of uh, Pirates of Caribbean then? I enjoyed the first. The first one mm -hmm. or two, uh, I did not really care for um, the one with the, the voodoo and um, the one which Blackbeard is. Yeah. If you if you make really different changes to history, those I have more problems with. Right. Um, and that one I found really was more fantasy than it was historical fiction. I didn't mind the fact that Barbarossa uh, became, um, oh, I don't know, would you call him a li living dead um, mm, right. because of the curse? That that was fine. I had no problem with that. Yeah. But um, when you bring in the snakes and <laughs> the other things, I'm not yeah. keen on. Yeah, they, uh, those movies kind of become more extreme as they go on. So. Exactly. But I think I think that's very interesting that you talked about the the witches and stuff because I think even in the even in the real history of vampires there is this aspect of uh, mysticism and magic. Like if you um, if you read, for example, uh, what uh, Dampier writes and what uh, Lionel Wafer writes, they write about these. Uh, they write some about voodoo and they write some about uh, sorcery practiced by uh, native peoples and by uh, uh, Africans living in the Caribbean and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Like Lionel, Lionel wrote about these um, Kuna sorcerers that were, uh, I mean, he he said that they worshipped the devil, but it was probably some some sort of local entity, uh, and they could uh, see the future from him. So. Oh uh, sure, but see, uh, to me, that's history. It's not right. fantasy. Right. A fantasy is when you incorporate things that they may be based on fact or superstition but you you give them too much of a fantastical element mm, right and go beyond the history yeah of course and the other thing to th remember is while lionel's wafer is writing about these things he's writing from the perspective of a european right he's not writing from the perspective of the indigenous people right so I'd be interested in think what the indigenous person thought of what was written and how it was, how much of it was fact and how much was it, was it Wafer's opinion of right. what he saw. Is there, is there any sort of myth or misconception about parts that you believed for really long? Well, I think the, the biggest misconception is people think that they're heroes, that they're, mm. they were nice guys. Mm. Um, they weren't e even even the buccaneers or the sea dogs or any of the periods of, mm. there's always an aspect of what they're doing that is not pretty right um, because in essence what they're doing is fighting and there's nothing pretty about fighting mm. and somebody gets hurt in the process yeah yeah, I think it's. I think it's also uh, uh, important to look at it from uh, a very sort of raw, but also very honest perspective. That uh, I mean, you can't you can't say that they were heroes, but at the same time, you gotta uh, view it from the sort of perspective of the time. They. Uh, what, what's interesting to me about the pirates, and we talked a bit about this, like you you said that um, uh, during the golden age, the uh, pirates went from being accepted to being unaccepted. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you kind of see this trend during the 1600s and even before as general that it's uh, right. acceptable to just plunder cities when you take them. Uh, mm -hmm. And just uh, re armies and kings, they behave in a very, very piratey way. Um, oh, sure. But of course, that, that kind of changed at the turn of the century, turn of the 1700s. Yeah, in fact, um, one of the um, adages that I really like is um, dates back to the time of Alexander the Great. Mm. And um, a pirate is brought before him and he's accused of doing something that Alexander does all the time. 
but Alexander is the person in power and the pirate is the person not in power. Right. And so he will be punished, but Alexander gets away with it. And time and again, that happens throughout history. Yeah. Um, the other, it, if you want a, f a fallacy about piracy, I think one is the assumption that what we think of as pirate, which would be the golden age, mm -hmm. is pirate throughout history. Right. And that's not true. Yeah. The ancient Greeks, or ancient piracy is different from golden age piracy. Yeah. And the same is true throughout, just like the buccaneers are different from the, go the golden age pirates. Yeah. Piracy evolves just like everything else does. Right. No, I think I think that's definitely something that's uh, uh, that's something that annoys me much personally because I, I always get requests on people that want me to cover uh, periods that are outside the period I focus on, and because I always tend to say that the the golden age was uh, uh, so exclusive in a sense because it was really highlighted, you know, and, uh, everything that happened then was very different from stuff that happened before and uh, after. Mm hmm. Well, and it's something something else along that lines is, is the, are the Vikings mm. or the Norse, the Northmen. Mm. Um, keep in mind, they didn't have a written language, so they didn't write about what they did. Right. Um, everything we know is written by somebody else. Yeah. And those people are usually the victims. Right. And so they're not going to portray a really true picture of what Norse culture was like. Yeah. Um, so it's the archaeologists who are teaching us that, well, the Vikings, the pirate period, is doesn't mean doesn't extend to the, all of Old Norse. Right. Um, and the people who lived there. Right. Um, when when you read some of the history, you find out all well, these people went to Russia and. Mm. Um, the Middle East, and um, so they did a lot that was good. Mm. I mean, they did a lot that was bad, but then so does every other culture. Yeah, of course. They wore, um, <laughs> this is uh, maybe a bit silly, but they wore blue clothes, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Blue was a very uh, very cheap and available dye in Scandinavia. <laughs> uh-huh. Sort of going back to this uh, this sort of talk on uh, fiction and uh, literature, um, lit literature. Oh man, that's uh, <laughs> that's a hard for, hard one for me. But what do you think the future of pirate media and literature is? You know, I've never thought about that. Mm. Um, I don't. I mean, there are lots and lots of pirate stories being written, and I think they are becoming more realistic. Mm. in the portrayals than they used to be. Mm. Um, there's um, a series that, don't ask me the title because it <laughs> escapes me at the moment. Right. There, um, that's uh, written by a gentleman who uses a pirate as, um, uh, who's, who's a carpenter by trade, oh. um, who solves mysteries. Oh. Um, they've, th that series has been interesting. Um, there's also one, um, The Braver Thing. Sorry, I was looking at the t books on my filing cabinet. Okay. It's called, it's called The Braver Thing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's basically um, historical fiction. Right. But it really makes you think, and it's really a bit horrifying, mm. but it's very realistic um and and yet on the other side i i read um a children's book a young adult mm. teen lit um mm -hmm. where um i was totally horrified reading this book and it does have a fantastical a scientifically based fantastical element to it Ugh. um but it, in, it it involves some kids who are all that's left of the pirate ship. Okay. There's, there's no crew, just the kids. And um, 
what happens when you introduce a disease or a germ okay. for which we don't know anything about? This was written in the 1800s when this type of scientific exploration was going on. Um, but it's really mind boggling at how realistic it was and how horrifying it could be not only then, but now, um, because just look at what COVID did. Yeah, and on a, on a ship that's a way more isolated uh, environment. Exactly. And so I, I think you're seeing, even though there's still things that are done in a more fantasy based or steampunk based genres, mm. the portrayal of pirates is more realistic to history. Right. And that's certainly something that I teach when I do my pirate workshops mm. is I want you yes I it's fine to have a good pirate but you also have to remember there are bad pirates right yeah and of, oftentimes this this sort of definition is uh, is very vague because if you look at um, a lot of pirates from the uh, from the sort of rampage um, a lot of them of course only ever they didn't kill anyone like there's no evidence of Blackbeard for example ever harming anyone Correct. Uh, but of course he traded in slaves uh -huh. But he also, you know, he also had um, had a slave boy that he raised himself. So I mm -hmm. mean, there's there's a lot of these like angles that you know where where does the where do you draw the line whether they're good or bad, you know, and what's why why did they do the things they do, you know, do they well, do? Well, see, it? I'm 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 of the opinion that every person has both a good bad side and right. a bad side. Yeah. And which side is the stronger of the two, yeah. I think depends on what your life experiences are yeah. and how much you can control your bad side versus your good side. Right. And I think what makes a really good story is psycho psychological development mm. and um, what you do with that. Because I think Blackbeard may have been, I've seen him portrayed as a very interesting character, mm. um, but he had a bad side Mm. as well as his good side no, and course. that's how he was that's why he became so successful mm. i think it's also what ultimately led to his downfall because he couldn't go on doing what he was doing and get away with it right yeah he became he became too big mm -hmm. no i think i think that's very interesting i also think uh, about the sort of what what circumstance changes a person and also what uh, what it requires, what kind of situation brings out your good side, and what kind of situation brings out your uh, your bad side. Uh, exactly. I mean, one of the things I, I've read two books recently about Stead Bonnet, one fiction, mm. one nonfiction. Okay. And what's interesting because Stead Bonnet is outside the mold of any pirate. Yeah. Um, because he was a gentleman to begin with. That's how he was raised. Right. And. Both of the both of these books portray that he was an okay guy until the time that his son, his his namesake son, I think it was his namesake, but his first son, the one who was most important to him, mm. died. And that after that, that and the fact that he had lost his parents, he had lost this, he had lost that, um, those losses build up and we believe he did not have a happy marriage no and he separates from his wife buys a ship makes it into a pirate ship and then hires a crew to go pirating right and i think those things that made him change if those things hadn't happened or if any one of those things had not happened would he have still become a pirate mm, right and i think i think in uh, in uh, bonnet's case there, I mean, there were a lot of other factors. Like, for example, I read a few months ago that he uh, he actually had pirate ancestors himself or privateer ancestors. So you know, he would uh, he would have that sort of oh, you know, my relatives were it. So why shouldn't I? Oh sure. Mm -hmm. And also the uh, mean... also you know the societal things at the time. Like uh, a lot of the quote unquote privateers or pirates, of course, active. Like uh, Henry Jennings, for example. You know, they they were gentlemen. So sure. Mm -hmm. And he was in debt, of course, you know, he needed money. Uh-huh. Well, it's, it's true, too, because um, 
in Louisiana, in New Orleans, the Americans take over. But this is a French and a Spanish, a European-based culture. Right. Um, even into the early 1800s when it changes hands so frequently. And they saw nothing wrong with smuggling. Mm, In fact, okay. you know, de depending, no matter what level of society you were on, you had brothers and fathers and husbands who participated in smuggling. And that's what Jean Lafitte did. And so the Creoles, the French, the, the original inhabitants or descendants of original habits, they didn't have a problem with him circumventing uh, customs and those types of things. Right. The Americans come in and that's a totally different mindset. And they don't like the smugglers and they don't like not paying tariffs <laughs> yeah. to customs. And so that's when they start trying to buckle down and make Jean Lafitte legitimate or a true criminal. Hmm. And it's that changing attitude that plays a role in, in the story. And it's slavery, I should have remembered this, slavery that is one of the catalysts that starts off the story because okay. um, there is a slave uprising oh, yeah. in New Orleans in 1810 um, right yes and or 11 somewhere around there mm -hmm. and i had actually visited destrahan which is one of the plantations where uh this took place um when i was in new orleans and learned about this and so i did some research and jean lafitte becomes one of the people blamed for the uprising Mm. because he was involved with the uh, transporting of residents of San Domingue, which we know as Haiti, mm -hmm. um, both uh, whites and blacks and slaves and free people, mm -hmm. to New Orleans. And he also sold. Now, he didn't really sell any of this. As far as we know, he did not sell the slaves from San Domingue but it was some of the slaves from San Domingue that started the uprising. Oh, wow. And because of his association with San Domingue, he was partially to blame. And this starts changing New Orleanians um, opinions of Lafitte mm -hmm. and the smuggling. Would you say then that because I, re I remember telling you, I, I remember that you told me that the book is largely about the uh, Baratarians. Would you say then that they also have this like sort of uh, more uh, quote unquote criminal mindset where smuggling is uh, societally acceptable? Yes. Well, of course they do because yeah. they do it. Yeah. And, and while we call Jean Lafitte a pirate, a privateer, mm -hmm. smuggling was the main portion of what they did. Right. Um, because they had Lafitte and his organization had a huge um underground operation that could bring not only they had not only auctions in the bayou he had a network that allowed them to transport what they stole or brought in and smuggle it into the city mm -hmm. and so yes i mean they were obviously a mindset of of what was acceptable and right. a lot of them were um of european heritage too hmm. um, one of the real characters in the book is ne coupe okay uh, his real name was louis chiquizola and i probably just butchered that. <laughs> he was italian okay um and um his nickname ne coupe is because um somebody in his past slashed his nose off oh and um, so cut nose is in is what ne coupe means okay. uh, in French. And um, so, but he lived on Grand Isle, uh, which is one of the barrier islands that was just hit by Ida. And um, he became a real figure. 
historical fixture, figure and part of that community. And yet he was a smuggler. He was a pirate. He was a privateer. Mm -hmm. um, and yet he's he's got kind of a folklore hero type persona. Right. That's how he's remembered. Um, and he was he participated with the Baratarians at the Battle of New Orleans. But like Dominic Yu, he eventually broke away from that way of life. Yeah, and of course, and since he has uh, some sort of uh, grievous visual injury, he has to appear in the in the pirate novel. Yes, of course. <laughs> I think uh, I think definitely this focus on this sort of uh, community of uh, quote unquote pirates or privateers. Uh, that's definitely going to be interesting to, to me, of course, and to, to a lot of my audience who are uh, interested in these similar communities like uh, uh, NASA, of course, and uh, Port Royal. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've been going on for a while, so I, uh, I think we're going to round off a bit with some, uh, okay. some more fun questions. Okay. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, I think I can guess to this one since we be, have been uh, talking about him a lot. But uh, who would you say your favorite uh, sea rover is? My favorite sea rover we haven't talked about okay. um, uh, is uh, Shengi So, mm -hmm. who also known as um, Madam Ching, mm -hmm. um, or the wife of Cheng. She was Chinese, and she was probably the most successful of all pirates throughout history, including, and I know this is sacrilege, Bartholomew Roberts. <laughs> yeah, the 200 um, fishing boats that he stole. Right. Um, but she did something that Bartholomew Roberts did not do. Um, he got he got killed. Yeah. She negotiated her own retirement and lived to a ripe old age of 80 and was quite successful in everything she turned her hand to. But she gave, began life as a prostitute. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's definitely a very steep rise to power. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, then of course the final, final little question, which is uh, everyone has to be asked at some point: uh, What is your favorite ship or sailboat? Well, it's the schooner. I I, I like this the schooner. Um, mm -hmm. Having lived in Baltimore for twenty years, I really got to know um, the pride of Baltimore, mm -hmm. um, the original ship. And um, I just, the schooners were just, um, they were fast. They were, especially the Baltimore schooners, they were fast, they were sleek. They really capture the imagination. Right. Um, in fact, in, in, eight, in sometime in the 18, early 1800s, they were described to being like a swan on water um, because of their design and the way, the the way they could um, move through the water. Um, they were very fast and very well built, but they were also dangerous ships to mm. sail because they have a low uh, board, which means they can, uh, the water gets up on them. Mm -hmm. And you had, it took a special person to be able to sail, sail them. Unfortunately, the pride of Baltimore uh, went down Mm. Uh, in the Caribbean, I believe, um, I guess in the eighties it was. And, um, so, but they rebuilt her and named mm. her pride too. Okay. And she's, she's Baltimore's ambassador. I, d I definitely wish the, uh, the city I, w I lived in has, had a, had a ship as a mascot. Uh, of course it's a, it's an inland city, so it's, it's a bit hard. Yeah. Just a tad. <laughs> but, um. I think it's also the schooner is a good pick because it's uh, always played a played a big role in in pirate literature. It does, uh, yes. Like David, I remember that David Cordingly spoke about it, and he uh, had a bunch of examples where the, of course, Treasure Island is probably the the biggest one with the Hispaniola. Uh huh. But yeah, so we we got uh, Madame Shing, we got the uh, we got the schooner, and we got uh, the rebel and the spy. So, uh, you know. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that's a very good discussion. So you know, um, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm always very bad at uh, you know ending things and saying goodbye. But you know, thank you for coming for the re-interview. Well, you're right. Welcome and thank you for having me. Uh, it's uh, it's been a real pleasure, and uh, I look I've forward. I've enjoyed it. 
Oh, that's that's great. I I hope the audience will uh, enjoy it as well because uh, there's a lot in here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I guess we can uh, cut it there and uh, say goodbye. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but... Well, you have a good rest of your day. And that was Cindy Valor from Pirates and Privateers .com. I hope you enjoyed the interview as much as I did. This is actually the second time we did the interview since I messed up the audio on the first. Whoops. The interview was a bit less structured back then, but I think we discussed a lot of varied and very interesting topics, like the purpose of the internet and internet content. She also gave me some insight then into how historical documentaries interview historians. It's pretty shady, uh, you can ask me about it in the comments and I'll tell you. All in all, both talks I had with Cindy were amazing and very educative, <laughs> for me at least. Uh, it's a long video, but I hope you enjoyed it. Otherwise, well, <laughs> I don't care. This will certainly not be the last interview on this channel. Is, is there anyone you want me to interview? Then you can tell me in the comments and your thoughts about this one. Cheers.